The Year of the Big Thaw by Marion Zimmer Bradley. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Year of the Big Thaw by Marion Zimmer Bradley. Mr. Emmett did his duty by the visitor from another world, never doubting the right of it. You say Matthew is your own son, Mr. Emmett. Yes, Reverend Owen, and a better boy never stepped if I do say it as shouldn't. I've trusted him to drive team for me since he was eleven, and you can't say more than that for a farm boy. Way back when he was a little shaver so high, when the war came on, he was bound, and he was going to sail with Admiral Thurgood. You know boys that age like runaway colts. I couldn't see no good in his being cabin boy on some tarnation navy ship, and I told him so. If he'd wanted to sail out on a whaling ship, I allow I'd have let him go. But Marthy, that's the boy's ma, took on so that Matt stayed home. Yes, he's a good boy and a good son. We'll miss him a powerful lot if he gets that scholarship thing. But I allow it'll be good for the boy to get some learning besides what he gets in the school here. It's right kind of you, Reverend, to look over this application thing for me. Well, if he is your own son, Mr. Emmett, why did you write birthplace unknown on the line here? Reverend Dahl, I'm glad you asked me that question. I've been turning it over in my mind and I've just about come to the conclusion it wouldn't be no-how fair to hold it back. I didn't lie when I said Matt was my son, because he's been a good son to me and Marthy, but I'm not his pa, and Marthy ain't his ma. So could be I stretched the truth just a mite, Reverend Dunn. It's a tarnal family yarn, but I'll walk into the meeting house and swear to it on a stack of Bibles as thick as a cord of wood. You know I've been farming the old corning place this past seven year. It's good, flat, Connecticut bottom land. But it isn't like our land up in Hampshire where I was born and raised. My pa called it the Hampshire Grants, and all that was King's Land when his pa came in there and started farming at the foot of Shattuck Mountain. That's Injun for fires, folks say, because the Injuns used to build fires up there in the spring for some of their heathen doodads. Anyhow, up there in the mountains we see a tarnal power of queer things. You call to mind the year we had the big thaw, about twelve years before the war. You mind the blizzard that year. I heard tell it spread down most to York. And at Fort Orange, the place they call Albany now, the Hudson froze right over, so they say. But those York folks do a sight of exaggerating, we're told. Anyhow, when the ice went out there was an almighty good thaw all over, and when the snow run off Shattuck Mountain there was a good-sized hunk of farmland in our valley went under water. The creek on my farm flowed over in the bank, and there was a foot of water in the cowshed, and down in the swimming hole in the back pasture wasn't nothing but a big gully, fifty foot and more across, rushing through the pasture, deep as a lake and brown as the old cow. You know, fresh as flood. Fill up with sticks and stones and old dead trees and somebody's old shed floating down the middle. And I swear to goodness, Partson, that stream was running along so fast I saw four-inch cobblestones floating and bumping along. Tied the cow and the calf, and Kate, she was our white mare. You mind she went lame last year, and I had to shoot her. But she was just a young mare then, and skittish as all get out. But she was a good little mare. Anyhow, I tied the whole kit and caboodle of them in the woodshed up behind the house, where they'd be dry, and I started to get the milk pail. Right then I heard the gosh, awfulest screech I ever heard in my life. It sounded like thunder and the freshet and forest fire all at once. I dropped the milk pail as I heard Marthy scream inside the house, and I run outside. Marthy was already there in the yard, and she points up in the sky and yelled, Look up yonder! We stood looking up at the sky over Shattuck Mountain, where there was a great big shoot now, and I don't know as I can call its name, but it was like a trail of fire in the sky, and it was making the dangest racket you ever heard. Reverend, looked kind of like one of them Fourth of July skyrockets, 
but it was as big as a house. Marthy was screaming, and she grabbed me and hollered, Hez, Hez, what in thunk it is it? And when Marthy cusses like that, Reverend, she don't know what she's saying. She's so scared. I was plumb scared myself. I heard Liza, that's her young'un, Liza Grace, that got married to the tailor boy. I heard her crying on the stoop, and she come flying out with her pony tail back and hollered to Marthy that the pea soup was burning. Marthy let out another screech and ran for the house. That's the woman for you. So I quieted Liza down some, and I went and told Marthy it weren't no more than one of them shooting stars. Then I went and did the milking. But you know, while we were sitting down to supper, there came the most awful grinding, screeching, pounding crash I ever heard. Sounded if it were in the back pasture, but the house shook as something had hit it. Martha jumped a mile, and I never saw such a look on her face. Hey, what was that? she asked. She now nothing but the freshest, I told her. But she kept on about it. You reckon that shooting star fell in our back pasture, Hez? Well, now, I don't allow it did nothing like that, I told her. But she was as jittery as an old hen, and it weren't like her no how. She said it sounded like trouble, and I finally quieted her down by saying I'd saddle Kate up and go have a look. Kind of thought, though I didn't tell Marthy that somebody's house had floated away in the freshet and rung against our back pasture. So I saddled up Kate and told Marthy to get some hot rum ready in case there was some poor soul run aground back there. I rode Kate back to the back pasture. It was mostly uphill, because the top of the pasture is on high ground, and it sloped down to the creek on the other side of the rise. Well, I reached the top of the hill and looked down. The creek were a regular river now, rushing along like Niagara. On the other side of it was a stand of timber, then the slope of Shattuck Mountain, and I saw right away the long streak where the timber had been cut out in a big scoop with roots standing up in the air and a big slide of rocks down to the water. It was still raining a mite, and the ground was sloshy and squashy underfoot. Kate scrunched her hooves and got real balky, not liking it a bit. But when we got to the top of the pasture, she started to whine and wicker and stomp and no matter how loud I woo-hawed, she kept on a stompin', and I was plumb scared she'd pitch me off into the mud. Then I started to smell a funny smell, like something burning. Now don't ask me how anything could burn in all that water, because I don't know. When we came up on the rise, I saw the contraption. Reverend, it was the most tarnal, crazy contraption I ever saw in my life. It was bigger than my cowshed and as long and thin as shiny as Marthy's old pewter picture her ma brought from England. It had a pair of red rods sticking out behind and a crazy globe fitting up where the top ought to be. It was stuck in the mud, turned halfway over on the little side of roots and rocks, and I could see what had happened all right. The thing must have been, now, Reverend, you can say what you like, but that thing must have flew cross attic and landed on the slope in the trees and turned over and slid down the hill. That must have been the crash we heard. The rods weren't just red. They were red hot. I could hear them sizzle as the rain hit them. In the middle of the infernal contraption there was a door, and it hung all to other as if every hinge on it had been wrenched halfway off. Suppose she told Kate alongside that I heard somebody hollering alongside the contraption. I didn't know how to get the words, but it must have been for help, because I looked down and there was a man flopping along in the water. He was a big fellow, and he wasn't swimming, just thrashing and hollering. So I pulled off my coat and boots and hove in after him. The stream was running fast, but he was near the edge, and I managed to catch on to an old tree root and hang on, keeping his head out of the water till I got my feet aground. Then I hauled him on the bank. Up above me, Kate was still whinnying and raising Ned, and I shouted at her as I bent over at the man. Well, Reverend, he sure gave me a surprise. Weren't no proper man I'd ever seen before. He's wearing some kind of red clothes, real shiny and sort of stretchy, and not wet from the water, like you'd expect, but dry and it felt like that silken india rubber stuff mixed together. 
and it was such a bright red that I first I didn't see the blood on it. When I did, I knew he were a goner. His chest were all stove in, smashed to pieces. One of the old tree roots must have jabbed him as the current flung him down. I thought he were dead already, but then he opened up his eyes. Funny color they were, greeny yellow, and I swear, Reverend, when he opened them eyes, I felt he was reading my mind. I thought maybe he might be one of them circus fellers in their flying contraptions that hang at the bottom of a balloon. He spoke to me in English, kind of choky and stiff, not like Joe the Portuguese sailor or like the eternal dumb Frenchies up in Canada way, but, well, funny, he said, my baby in ship, get baby. He tried to say more, but his eyes went shut and he moaned hard. I yelled, God almighty, excuse me, reverend, but I was so blame upset that it's just what I did say. God almighty, man. You mean there's a baby in that dingful contraption? He just moaned, so after spreading my coat around the man a little bit, I just plunged in that there river again. Reverend, I heard tell once about some tomfool idiot going over Niagara in a barrel, and I tell you, it was like that when I tried crossing that freshet to reach the contraption. I went under and down and was whacked by floating sticks and whirled around in the freshet. But somehow, I don't know how, except by the pure grace of God, I got across that ridge and torrent and climb up to where the crazy dingful machine was sitting. Ship, he called it. But that were no ship, Reverend. It was some flying dragon kind of thing. It was a real scary-looking thing, but I clumb up to the little door and hauled myself inside it. And sure enough, there was other people in the cabin, only they was all dead. There was a lady and a man and some kind of an animal looked like a bobcat, only smaller, with funny-shaped rooster comb hanging on its head. They all, even the cat thing, was wearing those shiny, stretchy clothes, and it was all so battered and smashed I didn't even bother to hunt for their heartbeats. I could see by a look they was dead as a doornail. Then I heard a funny little whimper like a kitten. And in a funny rubber cushion thing, there's a little boy baby, looked about six months old. He was howling lusty enough, and when I lifted him out of the cradle kind of thing, I saw why. That boy baby was wet, and his little arm was twisted under him. That there flying contraption must have smashed down awful hard, but that rubber hammock was so soft and cushiony, all it did to him was jolt him good. I looked around, but I couldn't find anything to wrap him in and the baby didn't have a stitch on him, except for a short of spongy paper diaper, wet as sin. So I finally lifted up the lady who had a long cape thing around her, and I took the cape off her real gentle. I knew she was dead, and she wouldn't be needing it, and that boy baby would catch his death if I took him out bare naked like that. She was probably the baby's ma, a right pretty woman she was, but smashed up something shameful. So anyhow, to make a long story short, I got that baby boy across that Niagara Falls somehow and laid him down by his paw. The man opened his eyes kind and said in a choky voice, Take care, baby. I told him I would and said I'd try to get him up to the house where Marthy could doctor him. The man told me not to bother. I'm dying, he says. We come from Planet Star up there crash here. His voice trailed off in a language I couldn't understand. It looked like he was praying. I bent over him and held his head in my hands real easy and so I said, Don't worry, mister. I'll take care of your little feller until your folks come after him. Before God, I will. So the man closed his eyes and I said, Our Father which art in heaven. And when I got through, he was dead. I got him up on Kate, but he was cruel heavy for all he was such a tall, skinny fella. Then I wrapped that there baby up in the cape thing and took him home and gave him to Marthy. The next day I buried the fellow on the south meadow, and the next meeting day we had the baby baptized, Matthew, Daniel, Emmett, and brung him up just like our own kids. That's all. All? Mr. Emmett, didn't you ever find out where that ship really came from? I reverend, he said it came from a star. 
Blind men don't lie, you know that. I asked a teacher about them planets he mentioned, and she says that on one of the planets, can't rightly remember the name, March or Mark or something like that, she says some big scientist feller with a telescope saw canals on that planet, and it'd have to be pretty near as big as this here airy canal to see them so far off. And if they could build canals on that planet, I don't know why they couldn't build a flying machine. I went back the next day when the water was down a little to see if I couldn't get the rest of them folks and bury them. The flight machine had broken up, washed down the creek. Marthy's still got the cape thing. She's a powerful saving woman. We never did pell Matt, though. Might make him feel funny to think he didn't really belong to us. But, uh, but, Mr. Emmett, didn't anybody ask questions about the baby, where you got it? Well, now, I'll lie, they was curious, because Martha hadn't been in the family way, and they knew it. But up here, folks minds their own business pretty well, and I just let them wander. Told Liza Grace I'd found her new little brother in the back pasture, and, of course, it was the truth. When Liza Grace grew up, she just thought it was just one of them yarns old folks tell the little shavers. And has Matthew ever shown any differences from the other children that you could see? Well, Urban, not so as you could notice. He's powerful smart. But his real pa and ma must have been right smart, too, to build a flyish contraption that could come so far. Of course, when he was about twelve years old, he started reading folks' minds, which didn't seem exactly right. He'd tell Marthy what I was thinking and things like that. He was just at a pesky age. Liza Grace and Minnie were both a courtin' then, and he'd drive their boyfriends crazy telling them what Liza Grace and Minnie were thinking, and teased the gals by telling them what the boys were thinking about. There weren't no harm in the boy, though. It was just all teasing. But it just weren't decent somehow, so I took him out behind the woodshed and gave his britches a good dusting just to remind him that that kind of thing weren't polite no how. Reverend Doan, he ain't never done it since. End of the Year of the Big Thaw by Marion Zimmer Bradley I'm a Stranger Here Myself by Mac Reynolds This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. I'm a Stranger Here Myself by Mac Reynolds The Place de France is the town's hub. It marks the end of Boulevard Pasteur, the main drag of the westernized part of a city, and the beginning of Rue de Libertaire, which leads down to the Grand Soco and the Medina. In a three-minute walk from the Place de France, you can go from an ultra-modern California-like resort to the Baghdad of Harun al-Rashad. It's quite a town, Tangier. King-sized sidewalk cafes occupy three of the strategic corners on the Place de France. The Café de Paris serves the best draft beer in town, gets all the better custom, and has three shoeshine boys attached to the establishment. You can sit on a sunny morning and read the Paris edition of the New York Herald Tribune while getting your shoes done up like mirrors for thirty Moroccan francs, which comes to about five cents at current exchange. You can sit there after the paper's read, sip your espresso, and watch the people go by. Tangier is possibly the most cosmopolitan city in the world. In native costume, you'll see Berber and Arif, Arab and Blue Man and occasionally a Senegalese from further south. In European dress you'll see Japs and Chinese, Hindus and Turks, Levantines and Filipinos, North Americans and South Americans, and, of course, even Europeans from both sides of the curtain. In Tangier you'll find some of the world's poorest and some of the richest. The poorest will try to sell you anything from a shoeshine to their not very lily-white bodies and the richest will avoid your eyes, afraid you might try to sell them something. In spite of recent changes, the town still has its unique qualities. 
As a result of them, the permanent population includes smugglers and black marketeers, fugitives from justice, and international conmen, espionage and counter-espionage agents, homosexuals, nymphomaniacs, alcoholics, drug addicts, displaced persons, ex-royalty, and subversives of every flavor. Local law limits the activities of a few of these. Like I said, it's quite a town. I looked up from my Herald Tribune and said, Hello, Paul. Anything new cooking? He sank into the chair opposite me and looked around for the waiter. The tables were all crowded, and since mine was a face he recognized, he assumed he was welcome to intrude. It was more or less standard procedure at the Café de Paris. It wasn't a place to go if you wanted to be alone. Paul said, How are you, Rupert? Haven't seen you for a donkey's years. The waiter came along, and Paul ordered a glass of beer. Paul was an easy-going, sallow-faced little man. I vaguely remembered somebody saying he was from Liverpool and in exports. "'What's in the newspaper?' he said disinterestedly. "'Fogo and Albert are going to fight a duel,' I told him. "'Little Abner is becoming a rock-and-roll singer.' He grunted. "'Oh,' I said, "'the intellectual type.' I scanned the front page. The Ruskies have put up another manned satellite. Yeah, have they? How big? Several times bigger than anything we Americans have. The beer came and looked good, so I ordered a glass, too. Paul said, What ever happened to those poxy flying saucers? What flying saucers? A French girl went by with a poodle so finely clipped as to look as though it had been shaved. The girl was in the latest from Paris, every poor in place. We both looked after her. You know what everybody was seeing a few years ago. It's too bad one of those bloody man satellites wasn't up then. Maybe they'd have seen one. That's an idea, I said. We didn't say anything else for a while, and I began to wonder if I could go back to my paper without rubbing him the wrong way. Didn't know Paul very well. But for that matter, it's comparatively seldom you ever get to know anybody very well in Tangier. Largely, cards are played close to the chest. My beer came and a plate of tapas for us both. Tapas at the Café de Paris are apt to be potato salad, a few anchovies, olives, and possibly some cheese. Free lunch, they used to call it in the States. Just to say something, I said... Where do you think they came from? And when he looked blank, I added, The flying saucers. He grinned. Mars or Venus or someplace. Hmm, I said. Too bad none of them ever crashed or landed on the Yale football field and said, Take me to your cheerleader or something. Paul yawned and said, That was always the trouble with those crackpot folks' explanations of them. If they were aliens from space... Then why not show themselves? I ate one of the potato chips. It had been cooked in rancid olive oil. I said, oh, There are various answers to that one. We could probably sit around here and think of two or three that made sense. Paul was mildly interested. Like what? Well, hell, suppose, for instance, there is this big galactic league of civilized planets. But it's restricted, see? You're not eligible for membership until you, well, say until you've developed space flight. Then you're invited to the club. Meanwhile, they send secret missions down from time to time to keep an eye on your progress. Paul grinned at me. I see you've read the same poxy stuff I do. A Moorish girl went by dressed in a neatly tailored gray jalaba. European-style high-heeled shoes and a pinkish silk veil, so transparent that you could see she wore lipstick. Very provocative. Dark eyes can be over a veil. We both looked after her. I said, oh, Here's another one. Suppose you have a very advanced civilization on, say, Mars. Not Mars, no air, and too bloody dry to support life. Don't interrupt, please. I said with mock severity. This is a very old civilization, and as the planet began to lose its water and air, it withdrew underground, uses hydroponics and so forth, husbands its water and air. 
isn't that what we'd do in a few million years if earth lost its water and air i suppose so he said anyway what about them well they observe how man is going through a scientific boom an industrial boom a population boom a boom period any day now he's going to have practical spaceships meanwhile he's got the h-bomb and the way he beats the drums on both sides of the curtain he's not against using it if he could get away with it paul said i got it so they're scared and are keeping an eye on us that's an old one i've read that a dozen times dished up different i shifted my shoulders well it's one possibility i got a better one how's this there's this alien life form that's way ahead of us their civilization is so old that they don't have any records of when it began and how it was in the early days they've gone beyond things like wars and depressions and revolutions and greed for power or any of these things giving us a bad time here on earth they're all like scholars get it and some of them are pretty jolly well taken by earth especially the way we are right now with all the problems get it things developing so fast we don't know where we're going or how we're going to get there i finished my beer and clapped my hands for molly how do you mean where we're getting well take half the countries on the world today they're trying to industrialize modernize catch up with the advanced countries look at egypt and israel and india and china and yugoslavia and brazil and all the rest trying to drag themselves up to the level of the advanced countries and all using different methods of doing it but look at the so-called advanced countries up to their bottoms and problems juvenile delinquents climbing crime and suicide rates the loony bins full of the balmy unemployed threat of war spreading all their money on armaments instead of things like schools all the bloody mess of it why a man from mars would be fascinated like molly came shuffling up in his baroque slippers and we both ordered another schooner of beer paul said seriously you know there's only one big snag in this sort of talk i've sorted the whole thing out before and you always come up against this brick wall where are they these observers or scholars or spies or whatever they are sooner or later we'd nab one of them you know scotland yard or the fbi or russia's secret police or the french sûreté or interpol this world is so deep in police counter espionage outfits and security agents that an alien would slip up in time no matter how much he'd been trained sooner or later he'd slip up and they'd nab him i shook my head not necessarily the first time i ever considered this possibility it seemed to me that such an alien would base himself in london or new york somewhere where he could use the libraries for research get the daily newspapers and magazines be right in the center of things but now i don't think so i think he'd be right here in tangier oh right, tangier it's the one world in town where anything goes nobody gives a damn about you or your affairs for instance i've known you a year or more now and i haven't the slightest idea of how you make your living that's right paul admitted this town you seldom even ask a man where he's from he can be british a white russian a basque or a sikh and nobody could care less where are you from rupert california i told him no you're not he grinned i was taken aback what do you mean i felt your mind probe back a few minutes ago when i was talking about scotland yard or the fbi possibly flushing an alien telepathy is a sense not trained by the humanoids if they had it your job and mine would be considerably more difficult let's face it in spite of these human bodies we're disguised in neither of us is a humanoid where are you really from rupert aldebaran i said how about you deneb he told me shaking we had a laugh and ordered another beer what are you doing here on earth i asked him researching for one of our meat trusts 
We're protein eaters. Humanoid flesh is considered quite a delicacy. How about you? Scouting a place for thrill tourists, my job is to go around to these backward cultures and help stir up intertribal or international conflicts, all according to how advanced they are. Then our tourists come in, well shielded, of course, and get their kicks watching it. Paul frowned. That sort of practice could spoil an awful lot of good meat. End of I'm a Stranger Here Myself by Mac Reynolds